It's Mari McInerney from Crokey here at the Royal Australian New Zealand Psychiatrists uh, Annual Meeting in Cairns and I have Professor Felice Jacker here. Would you be able to introduce yourself uh, and what you do? So I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist, I'm a professor um, and I head up the Food and Mood Centre at Deakin University which is part of the School of Medicine. Fantastic. Now you have just presented on nutritional psychiatry. Can you explain first what that is and why it seems to be having a very big impact? Well it's really looking at the possible role of nutrition in mental disorders but also the application of nutrition for both prevention and treatment of mental health problems. Now, you said that um, it, it's a very new field, it's about 10 years old, and that you came up with some resistance, but that you've also perhaps come up with a bit of things where people go, well, isn't that obvious that what we eat affects us? What have, what have been the contentions around that and what's sort of taken you through that? Yeah. Well, there was a lot of scepticism at the start when I first proposed my PhD study, and I think that that was justified because there had been a lot of really poor quality um, evidence in inverted commas out there regarding nutrition and mental health like for example the field of orthomolecular medicine for example which is anything but evidence-based so it had uh, tarnished the, the reputation and so people were very skeptical part of that I think is to do with the fact that um, even though poor diet is the leading cause of early death in men and number two in women across the globe most medical practitioners will only get about two hours of training in nutrition during their, their training. So they don't think about nutrition in that way. And also this idea of the mind and body being separate, that very much informed that sort of thing. But then from the public's point of view, there was this sort of, well, don't we already know this? Which of course we didn't because we've known for a very long time that nutrition is important for physical health outcomes, but the link with mental health had not been explored uh, scientifically and certainly not with scientific rigor. And so what have you found, you know, what have been the major studies that you've done that, that has, has developed this whole field now? Well we've led studies, we've led the first ones in adults, adolescents and children and pregnancy and of course others have also develop the evidence base. So we now have a very large and consistent evidence base across countries, across cultures, and right across the age span to say that the quality of your diet is linked to your risk for depression in particular, that's mainly where the evidence is, that this doesn't seem to be explained by things like education, income, body weight, other health behaviors. It doesn't seem to be explained by reverse causality, so people eating differently because of their mental health problems, although of course that is a, um, does happen. Um, so the observational evidence is very, very clear. There's a very large body of evidence from animal studies about the impact of diet on brain plasticity and behaviour and those sorts of things. But the evidence around changing people's mental health by changing their diet, that is more new. Uh, and there we only have two randomised control trials, but both of those, including our SMILE study, showed that if you take people with depression and you help them to improve their diet, it has a substantial benefit to their mood. Uh, we've also just published a meta-analysis that's looked at a whole range of studies where they haven't necessarily got people with depression, but they happen to have measured depressive symptoms and they've looked at the impact of dietary change on whatever else they're investigating, and they've also measured depression. And we've shown that uh, improving diet or addressing diet does have a measurable benefit to depression. And you're now going beyond depression, where, which I think perhaps a lot of people would do, you know, that, yeah. yes, that makes sense, mm -hmm. but you're looking at the impact of food diet uh, on disorders like schizophrenia. That's correct. So there's been some fantastic work by, for example, colleagues of ours up in Cindy, Sydney at the Bondi Clinic showing that lifestyle programs, lifestyle medicine, so helping people to, uh, who've just been diagnosed with uh, psychosis, schizophrenia, they're going on to the anti-psychotic medications which can have a really terrible impact on their metabolic health, that if you help them to uh, learn how to cook and how to shop and how to improve their diet but also to, to undertake exercise, that that can really mitigate a lot of the negative impacts on their physical health but we're only just starting to measure the effects on their mental health of doing that. So we're starting to see that exercise, for example, seems to really help the schizophrenia symptoms as well as their health. Um, and it also helps people with schizophrenia, it helps their cognition, their brain to work better. 
but we don't have an equivalent evidence base for. He's telling us at the moment about uh, where practice should be, uh, what should happen, yeah. uh, and uh, I'm taking into account too, you mentioned that study in Bondi um, for, for the, uh, young people with psychosis, and that was presented recently at the Equally Well Symposium, where they're talking about the impact of medications, etc., on um, on people's physical health. What what are the lessons for psychiatrists in all this? What, what should well, they Well, if you look at do? the updated clinical guidelines from the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, they clearly say that if you have a patient with mood disorders, step zero is actually sleep hygiene, but diet, exercise, smoking, cessation. So what we would call lifestyle medicine. Now we need to reclaim this term lifestyle medicine because it's been conflated with integrative medicine or complementary medicine which doesn't have an evidence base but lifestyle medicine has a very very big evidence base for, for health outcomes. So I think lifestyle medicine needs to be the fundamental on which everything else is built. It's certainly not instead of other treatments but it, it provides the foundation for, for healing for whatever health outcome we're looking at. So what would you say to a practitioner, um, to, a, to a psychiatrist mm. at the moment, what would you say that's the first thing that they should be doing? Yeah. And if I can also add to that too, is that sense that a lot of consumers feel there's already so much scrutiny on them. Um, so how do you address that as an issue too? Yeah, two really good questions. Firstly, I think we, we want to get dietitians on the Medicare schedule so that we, so people with mental disorders can access dietetic support. I think that's one really key thing. But in clinical practice, if people are not wanting to go and see a dietitian, the, the practitioner can just start with those simple questions. What do you like to eat? What do you have for breakfast, lunch and dinner? And then just talk to them about gradually making those really basic changes. You know, if they're having a sweet cereal for breakfast, you can get them to have oats or muesli. If they're having a, a white bread, palmy for lunch, get them to have a whole grain and add some salad. Those sorts of basic things, and it doesn't need to be more expensive. We've shown that with our economic evaluations and our cost effectiveness uh, modelling. You can do tinned um, beans, tinned salmon, frozen veggies, all of those things. It can be easy, it can be quick, and it can be affordable. But we need to get some more training into, uh, you know, when we, we're teaching medical students, they need to understand the importance of nutrition and physical e exercise because. As I said, nutrition is the leading cause of early death in men, number two in women, and we're not paying anywhere near enough attention to it. But the second thing is you make a point about the individual and putting the emphasis back on the individual. Now, two things we've noted. One is that people with mental disorder often really like this because it does give them their power back to say, okay, I can make those changes for myself. That's fantastic. But a lot of the conversation I have is about the public health environment and the need for governments to change the food environment, to enact legislation and taxation so that these ultra-processed food products that now make up approximately 60% of the average in energy intake of Americans and about 35 to 40% in Australia, so that those foods are no longer the cheapest, the most heavily marketed, the most uh, ubiquitous and the most socially acceptable. Well, isn't that handy that we've got a federal election coming up this oh, Sunday? Oh, yes, and it was very encouraging to see uh, the Labor Party endorsing the possibility of uh, enacting the recommendations of the tipping the scales um, strategy, which is around obesity prevention in Australia, and part of that is a, uh, a tax on sugar sweetened beverages, but a whole suite of other things and we work closely with obesity prevention people because we think that anything that helps to tackle their unhealthy food environment and you know in, um, increase sedentary behavior anything that tackles those things is likely to have a benefit for mental health and not just for physical health and obesity. So for people who want to find out more about your work, they can go to a website, they can read a book. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you So advise? we've got the Food and Mood Centre website, which we're just about to um, update, but at the moment it's got um, you know information for the lay public. And I've also just published a book in February through Pan Macmillan Press called Brain Changer, and that's in all uh, bookstores and on Amazon and Kindle and Audible and all of those sorts of things. So that, again, it's for the lay public. It's not a science book. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's Elise. a pleasure.